it takes one juror. Joining me now, David Schoen, former Trump impeachment lawyer, Saul Weisenberg, former deputy independent counsel and former assistant U.S. attorney, as well as Mike Davis, founder and president of the Article 3 Project. Saul, uh, let's start with you. What about that last point? Um, lay out the process, if you would, for jury, jury selection in this type of case. How long could it take? How critical is it? Well, when you say this type of case, there really is no case just like this, a former president indicted and going to trial. Unfortunately, in most federal criminal trials, unlike in state trials, very limited what we call voir dire in some parts of the country and voir dire in Texas, <laughs> uh, where you get to question the jury uh, before you select them. Uh, there is very limited voir dire by the attorney. It's almost all done by the judges in the federal, federal judicial system. Uh, my guess is that that will be loosened up a bit in this particular case. But also, I, I would like to say that uh, I think it's a little pessimistic to have to say we're going to rely on one juror to engage in jury nullification, because I think the president has some real um, defensible issues here. This is a winnable case. I'm not saying he would definitely win it or it's a slam dunk for him, but there are some real issues here. And I don't think he's going to have to rely on jury nullification necessarily. I'm going to get back to that in a moment. But, David, I want to play a moment from Obama's SG earlier today. He's not president anymore. He doesn't get to, you know, when you leave the presidency, take home documents as a souvenir. This is the people's information. That's why we have such a robust set of criminal rules to protect against the mishandling of it. Trump just spit on all of that, according to this indictment. Nothing I've heard, you know, tells me that he has a viable defense. David, again, it's just declared. No defense at all. Pick up where Saul just left off. Well, uh, addressing what the Solicitor General said, apparently, uh, it's, it's really outrageous for a Justice Department official to say something like that and try to color things in that regard. They have an obligation to the system and the integrity of the system to uh, not put out that kind of statement. Listen, uh, you know, the president is unique. A former president is unique. Congressional uh, Research Service put out a piece in February talking about the protocols that former presidents regularly get the uh, intelligence briefings. So the former president, like a president, has that knowledge in his mind. What if President Trump had just talked about what was in the documents? Is that covered by the, uh, by the charges in this case? This case is about documents. But there are all kinds of defenses in this case, starting with, you know, the presentation of evidence they had to the grand jury with the Evan Corcoran notes. You've got uh, CIPA, CIPA issues here. They're going to have to be played out. And you have mainly the mens rea in this case, whether President Trump will acted willfully, which in this context means knowingly did something the law prohibited, all of the evidence that we've seen so far indicates exactly the opposite. He believed he was entitled to do what he did. Now, Mike, as a former practicing attorney myself for white collar criminal defense, you know, if I were advising a client, a regular client, I'd say, like, don't try to litigate this in the press. Right? That's usually a loser. But this is a different situation. But is there still a danger for President Trump to speak out publicly about the case, as he did tonight, um, given how we know they try to use everything against him, and they can use that, anything he says publicly against him at trial? Well, we all know that no lawyer is going to muzzle President Trump, and frankly, they shouldn't. This is a political indictment against him. They are ignoring the Presidential Records Act at the Biden Justice Department. They are ignoring the 2012 Clinton sock drawer case. They are ignoring the 2019 Office of Legal Counsel legal opinion that you generally can't obstruct investigations into non-crimes. They know that President Trump had the right to these records under the Presidential Records Act. They know that the Presidential Records Act does not have a criminal component. And for them to charge espionage for, for Trump, uh, just simply retaining, not even using, not even harming our, our nation's national security, simply having his presidential records, which he's allowed to have under the Presidential Records Act, is not going to stand as a matter of law. Saul, I want to get back to your point earlier that you believe there are uh, uh, deficiencies, at the very least, in this indictment. Uh, what is the number one um, vulnerability you think the prosecution has with this charging document? 
I, I think that there, the number one vulnerability has to do with um, the information that, that apparently came from the former lawyers, because I think there's an assumption uh, that these are going to be uh, witnesses who are going to be friendly to the government and hostile to the president. And in my experience, uh, remember, these are lawyers. The government came in and they broke the attorney-client privilege. They convinced a judge in Washington that the crime fraud exception to that privilege applied. And that's why they were able to question these former lawyers that are they're, they're referenced in the indictment. So these lawyers aren't going to necessarily get on the stand and give the same interpretation to President Trump, Trump's statements uh, that the prosecution apparently wants us to believe. So I think that's a vulnerable a vulnerability. I think their strongest counts are the uh, obstruction counts. And David, another media uh, constant during this uh, past few days has been the attacks on Judge Eileen uh, Cannon, who's presiding over this case as federal district court judge. Now, this continued today. Watch this. The judge does not have great experience. Most judges there, and certainly Judge Cannon, does not have experience. She's proved that, certainly, with her decisions, her earlier rulings after the search. Uh, that she yeah, doesn't well, have experience well, with handling classified be, documents. But, uh, and arguably, but, she doesn't even understand the different, the different levels of security. Now, David, I'm not sure if Andrew Mitchell has actually heard any of the oral arguments at the Supreme Court, but Katanji Brown Jackson was on the Court of Appeals for, what, six months? Uh, I don't I don't recall the media being all worried about her experience to be a Supreme Court justice. But now this this district court judge can't handle it. I mean, come on. It's, it's extraordinary and it's offensive. This is a judge picked by random selection. She's an American success story, daughter of a Cuban refugee, worked her way up in Miami, stellar academic credentials, clerked for a great judge. Um, worked for a big firm, and has been a career prosecutor, a law and order judge, very bright person, very well respected. They point to all of these scraps of, uh, you know, she entered an opinion earlier in this case that was reversed. Every great judge in this country has big been deal. reversed. Yeah, and, and, and plus we know that you don't use judges' decisions for recusal purposes. All of these same people then challenge lawyers who suggest the judge in New York who wasn't picked randomly, who was assigned, hand-picked, for the original Trump Organization case, the Bannon prosecution, and now this Trump case, that judge is perfectly fine with them, and no lawyer should suggest otherwise, even though a federal court has said this hand-picking process they use in New York Supreme Court in New York County is subject to a question as to whether it gives the appearance of partiality. Mike, do you think the um, Mr. Nauda, who is uh, also a co, you know, another defendant in this case, the order from the judge was that the president could not speak with him about the case, any witnesses, including uh, him, who's obviously being charged along with him. How concerned are you about that, uh, given the fact that, obviously, he still works with the president on a daily basis? Well, I'm not concerned about this. Uh, look, I, I get this indictment lays out bad facts, and this is just an indictment. This, these are just allegations. Remember, though, that there are serious legal deficiencies with this indictment that can be cha challenged as a matter of law. And at the end of the day, think about what Biden and his Justice Department are trying to do. They're trying to put in prison Biden's political enemy, they want him to die in prison because they fear that he's actually going to win back the White House in November of 2024. And that's what this is all about. David, uh, thank you, Saul. Mike, all of you stay with us.